three, two, one. Hello, my name is Dr. Freddy Calderadio, and I'm an associate professor at University of Wisconsin. And today I'm going to be giving you an update of COVID-19 vaccines and how it pertains to patients with IBD. So I'm gonna give you an update of how we're doing with SARS-CoV-2 infections in the US and recent data from the CDC discussed the new monovalent COVID-19 vaccines and go over what we know about the different therapies we use to treat IBD and how it may impact vaccine response. But before we get started, just a refresher of how are vaccines recommended in the US and who decides who should be getting boosters, who should be getting a COVID-19 vaccine. There is a work group called the Advisory Committee on Immunizations Practice. And the role of this group, it's consisted of medical and public health experts that develop recommendations on how to use vaccines in the US. They provide advice to the CDC or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on developing adult and childhood immunization schedules, even pre-COVID. So this September, on September 12th, the ACIP met to discuss recommendations of COVID-19 vaccines in the general population. Because just to put things in perspective, as uh, someone who has inflammatory bowel disease should know, you need to know what is going on with the pandemic. Obviously, many of us have had COVID fatigue due to all the impact we had from the pandemic. But I'm going to share with you some data of where we are now. So on the graph, you can see weekly hospitalization due to COVID-19 among adults 18 years of age and older. And as you can see in the graph here, the dotted line has older adults above 75, 65 and up, 50 to 64, and 18 to 49 year olds. And as you can see, well, Delta and Omicron resulted in higher rates of hospitalizations, particularly for older adults, we're still seeing an impact of COVID-19. Uh, where it's still resulting in some hospitalizations. At that ACIP meeting, to put something in perspective, uh, they all CDC also shared data of the percent of COVID-19 and influenza associated hospitalizations that would result in an ICU stay among adults. They use two large registries to monitor COVID-19 called COVID-Net and influenza called FluNet. And they looked at hospitalizations due to COVID-19 or influenza from October, 2022 through April, 2013. And I use this slide in patients who are willing to get an influenza vaccine, but may be on the fence of whether they need another COVID-19 booster. We know that last year we saw lower rates of uptake of the bivalent booster. And what we can see here is that across all age groups, COVID-19 is more likely to result in a hospitalization with ICU admission compared to influenza. And I use this data to tell my patients that if you're willing to get an influenza vaccine, you should definitely be willing to get a new COVID-19 booster. And before we start talking about the booster, I'm gonna take a step back and talk about what we know about the impact of COVID in patients with IBD. Uh, this is some older data from pre-vaccine, but it's still important to know that patients with IBD are not at increased risk for severe COVID or resulting in hospitalization. So this is pre-vaccine data. 
This is great data we have from Secure, something you might have heard of before, which was an international database to determine whether patients with IBD or their therapies increase the risk for a bad COVID outcome. And what this large registry showed is that those who are older, have chronic medical conditions, or on corticosteroids really are at increased risk. The biologics we use to commonly treat uh, IBD were not associated with bad COVID outcomes. And the ACIP, the group I discussed about previously at the beginning of the pandemic and previously has always provided special advice for people who are immunocompromised, which consists about 3% of the US population. And this group is a not a homogeneous group because this can include patients with uh, solid organ cancer, uh, patients who've had a transplant, patients living with IBD, with HIV, or patients who are on biologic or small molecules, like patients with IBD. And in the past, the ACIP has made special recommendations for immunocompromised groups, but they don't make them based on disease state. They make them sort of broad definition. They provide a special recommendations for the pneumococcal vaccine, for the old live shingles vaccine, And as vaccines for COVID-19 were coming around, they made special recommendations because this graph shows you different groups of immunosuppressed groups, patients with cancer, those on hemodialysis, solid organ transplant recipients, and those who are on biologics or small molecules, which included different uh, medications such as rheumatoid, and rheumatoid arthritis and et cetera. And as you can see in this group, the people who made antibodies after two doses of vaccine, those who were solid organ transplant recipients were less likely to make antibodies after two doses of a vaccine. So because of that, back in August of 2021, the ACIP made a recommendation that immunocompromised individuals, which included those on high-dose corticosteroids, patients on anti-TNFs or immunomodulators such as isotypin and methotrexate should receive an additional dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. The CDC also defined everyone who they consider moderately to severely immunosuppressed. At the time of this recommendation, it was sent based on studies showing that patients were less likely to mount a vaccine response. This was based on a definition of who could get a live vaccine or not. And we know that COVID-19 vaccines are safe in patients with IBD. Multiple studies previously have shown that non-COVID-19 vaccines such as influenza, pneumococcal, and hepatitis B are safe and they're not associated with disease flares. And as far as COVID, we have large patient registries such as Prevent, Corral, Stop COVID that found that the vaccines are safe, they're not associated with disease flares. Patients with IBD are likely to have local reactions after vaccination, just like in the general population. And these can be pain at the injection site, um, fatigue, myalgias, and that these adverse reactions are not worse after a booster dose. What do we know as far as patients able, being able to mount an antibody response? Thankfully, we have some great research in patients with IBD that showed that the majority of patients with IBD are able to mount an antibody response after two doses which is very different than solid organ transplant recipients or patients with rheumatological conditions. So a summary of the many studies that have been done in patients with IBD tell us that most patients are able to mount an antibody response. The antibodies may be lower than those who don't have IBD. It appears that betalizumab and lucitinumab 
aren't associated with a lower antibody response. We see that after a booster dose and after three doses of vaccine, patients are able to mount good antibody response. The response is sustained for six months and it's seen higher after SARS-CoV-2 infection. There are some people who may have a lower antibody response, especially those on corticosteroids greater than two weeks, those on anti-TNF therapy, or some of the JAX inhibitors. We have limited data on some of our newer therapies. We also know that patients with IBD are able to mount a cell-mated immune response, and that's making at T cells, and those are able to help provide protection against severe disease. We know that most patients after two doses are able to mount this response. The response is boosted by a third dose, and that response can be maintained for six months. So what should patients be getting now? After that ACIP meeting, a new monovalent COVID-19 vaccine booster was recommended. In the US, uh, both the Moderna, Novavax, and Pfizer BioNTech has been updated to be a monovalent. So there only includes one strain that's from the Omicron sublineage. The original or the bivalent uh, should not longer be used and it's no longer available. So for someone who's been previously vaccinated, the ACIP does not provide a preference. They can either get a Moderna, Novavax, or a Pfizer BioNTech booster. They did provide special recommendations for those who are quote unquote immunosuppressed, all based on the original studies in the general population, not based on patients like the Dean. And they recommend patients who are immunosuppressed should be getting an updated booster, and they may receive an additional dose up to eight weeks from their last dose. But what is really the takeaway from all of this? We know that most patients with IBD are not considered immunosuppressed. They're on immune-modifying therapies, so they probably don't need an additional dose of vaccine. Even if those who they may get an additional dose, maybe they should be considering those on systemic corticosteroids greater than 20 milligrams when they receive the uh, new booster, or maybe those on anti TNFs. Some common scenarios that I've been asked is what should you do if you've had a recent COVID 19 infection? And you probably should wait at least three months prior to getting your booster, that's the official uh, recommendation. I also get a question of, should I get my influenza along with my COVID-19 vaccine? And yes, you are allowed to get and administer other vaccines along with this new booster. But we're learning more and more about uh, COVID. And I would tell you, um, well, COVID has become more the norm, and you may know many patients or many other people or friends or family members who've had COVID and done fine. I would say the goal of now is not only preventing things like hospitalization, but also preventing post-COVID conditions. So this was a study from the CDC they published where they found, they use a large data set from an electronic health record where they compared adults with a COVID-19 infection compared to those who have not had a previous COVID infection. And they found that one in five adults had a health condition that might be related to the previous COVID illness. They found that those with COVID-19 were twice as risk for developing a blood clot in their lungs or a pulmonary embolus or a respiratory condition and one in five COVID survivors um, develop other conditions such as cardiovascular conditions, neurological and mental health conditions, kidney failures, and musculoskeletal conditions. So definitely a good reason to get an updated booster. We also, our group 
recently published a study where we looked at the risk of developing shingles after a SARS-CoV-2 infection in patients with IBD. And what we found was that both in the pre-vaccine and the post-vaccine era, that patients with IBD were at higher risk for developing shingles or herpes zoster, which is the reactivation of the chickenpox virus after a COVID infection. So as we discussed, you can get other vaccines such as influenza. If you're above age 65, consider talking to your provider about getting a vaccine that's recommended for older adults, such as high dose or two other vaccines meant for adults 65 and up. If you are on anti-TNF monotherapy, talk with your provider about getting a high dose influenza vaccine. But the take home points would be to definitely consider uh, getting an updated vaccine booster, just like getting an influenza vaccine, just to help prevent a respiratory illness that may result in hospitalization. And as I've shown you, there are other things that can happen after post-COVID uh, a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Additionally, the studies so far are very reassuring that the many therapies we use to treat IBD don't impact, seem to have a big impact on the vaccine response. So even if you're on certain therapies, you're able to still mount a response to protect you. Thank you very much.